The whole purpose of today's session is to have an open discussion, really, uh, on quality workshop. Uh, I'm going to avoid to show any slides which are not being sort of, you know, coming up as a question or something. Then I will pull up the relevant slide in that question area. And so I'm going to start talking just freely about what we are doing and why we are doing it. So uh, what we are doing, NVIDIA, together with Dell, is that there was maybe a little bit more than 10 years ago, there was some scientists working to develop codes on our technology. By then, we were what was called a GPU company. So every, I think, is there anybody here who doesn't know what GPU is? I can explain that. So GPU stands for Graphical Processing Unit. So we come from the graphic side. So we sit inside many, many computers, especially computers which are used for gaming, anything that's like needing some advanced visual thing, that painting a pretty picture on a screen. That's where we came from. But a lot of scientists were starting to use these GPUs for other stuff than they were meant for. So there was a guy actually in the university who created a language called CUDA, where he programmed the GPU to execute mathematical uh, problems. And it did it so much faster than the CPU, it was amazing. So, okay, this came to our knowledge I I at NVIDIA. So what we eventually did at NVIDIA was we, we hired that guy. So he now works for us and he heads up the accelerated uh, division. So we we're trying now to talk about acceleration then rather than GPU. So acceleration is when you use this other kind of computer chips. So it's not a CPU, it's a GPU. And the difference is that the GPU is much, much more parallel. So why is it parallel then? Because it had to paint all those little pixels on the screen. So do, to paint all those pixels on the screen and do that in, uh, immediately in a very fast manner, you need to be highly parallel. So that's where our architecture came from, being highly parallel. So if you can then write a code which is highly parallel, you can utilize this super powerful compute chip. So by accident, we ended up in this room then, more or less, by this scientist. And, and it was actually not only him, it was simultaneously with him, some other scientists at some other places were actually doing work as well uh, in this area. Uh, and, but he was the first one who sort of invented CUDA, and we hired him. So some years later then, there was a similar happening at Stanford and in Switzerland at about the same time. And, and these scientists still argue which one was the first. It's like arguing who was the first to the moon, really, you know, if it ever happened. Um, <laughs> but these, these are scientists, they still argue about this. So that I, no, I was first, I was first. I was first to do then what uh, artificial intelligence or deep learning, as we call it, or algorithms to execute on the GPU. And, and why did they do this? Why did they choose the GPU? Well, it's because deep learning algorithms are highly parallel in their nature. So the, uh, in the original sort of first happenings in this area, it was actually all about cats. So there was uh, an algorithm that uh, you, you, you used to, to be able to detect if it was a cat or not on a picture. That was one of the first examples in, in deep learning. So then you, the, you compete, you have a competition then where you compete and who can be the best in, in detecting what it is on the picture. And in this competition, a guy turned up with a GPU code. And he was simply throwing all the other codes on, uh, down in the gutter when it came to performance. So not only was it much, much faster to detect the cats, it was also much, much more accurate to detect the cats because you, because you can have more layers because the GPU is highly parallelized. It has a lot, a lot of cores and a fast memory attached to it. So that's the history why we ended up in this room, uh, NVIDIA, Dell, that because of these happenings, really. And these happenings were not planned by our company. It happened by chance. So now I would expect the first question right about now, if you're going to have any kind of workshop here. I'm just going to be very boring to listening to me speaking all the time. So, I mean, somebody has to have some kind of a question. Otherwise, I will continue to rabble about uh, examples I and have a things. Question. Yeah, great. Yes. Yeah. So is this thingy yeah. applicable to black cats in a black room? We talked about that before. Yes, it is. is there's, it there's, at something the, at called, there's something called... Uh, 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 
There's something called um, radar technology, and radar technology can be used in many different ways. There's radar with uh, using light, and there's radar using other kind of technology, the radio waves, and anything, anything where you can get back something. When you can get back that sort of uh, data from, from that sort of, you send out something, it comes back, and you read that data, and something called a LiDAR, and you might have heard of some. There's always lots of technology we can see in the dark, yes. And those can then work on that data and figure out it might be a cat. But, it, with, but it's like, you know, of course, it's much more advanced. It's, a, it's, a, it's one excellent example that I'd love to look at. Uh, uh, do you have a children? Yes. So we, did you go with, uh, I guess it's a mother involved then as well. Yes. We did, if you go to the hospital and then they use this technology, you know, where they, where they point this thing to the stomach, mm -hmm. and then you can see some picture of the child in the stomach on yes, the screen. Yes, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So using that technology, that some people have applied deep learning to those images, and based on those images, you, you know, that it, you can't actually, maybe you could see if it was a boy or a girl, but you couldn't really see that it was like a, you know, how it was going to look in the end. Mm -hmm. so, but there are people that developed algorithms, deep learning algorithms on that data that you can now use it on the heart and you can then see in a 3D picture of that actual heart how it is pumping and you can actually see if it's not working correctly or not. That's been developed by a scientist in Norway called Eric Steen. And everybody that wants to, 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 to learn more about it, you can just Google this Eric Steen heart. And it's, he's working partly at the university in, law in, in Norway, but he also has a position at GE Medical, where they sell this technology now to, to, as, a, as a product out to the hospitals. Another area where they have started to selling actual products to the hospitals in, in, with relates to deep learning then is what IBM is doing with the Watson product. Which, um, is another example where you have a deep learning algorithm, you, you apply it to a certain field of medicine, and then you can start using it and selling it to these kind of hospitals to make it easier for people to get diagnosed in the right way. Because otherwise, it's more like chance, you know. Are you, are you going to find the right doctor, or are you going to end up like waiting a long time to find the right doctor? You might end up meeting the wrong doctor. So they might not diagnose you in with the, if you have some kind of a disease or if you're okay. But so using this kind of technology, they can help diagnose patients in a more consistent way by always asking the same questions. And, you, and based on those questions, looking at all the knowledge that is gathered in that sort of knowledge deep learning uh, system, what we call neural networks. In that neural network, you can actually be able then to diagnose people in a more efficient way. So it's also, also one of the very first commercial products that we see in this area. And I'm sure you all have read about self-driving cars, have you? So how many people are, uh, are from the car or the truck industry? Yeah, there's quite a few. Because the automotive industry is the single industry where we have gained the most traction. So basically all the automotive companies are working together with NVIDIA on these technologies. So let me change my slide deck. Now I can actually show a new slide again. Yeah, great. So let's choose probably that, yeah. I already talked about this. We don't need to cover this part. Though. So let's, st let's start from, yeah. So automotive companies were probably the industry where we are the, the most uh, established today when it comes to deep learning. Uh, at the same time as we are very established in the gaming industry, but from, a, but from our old uh, roots, you know, showing pretty pictures on a screen in a fast and correct way. So that's where it's all happening. Um, the, there is a, a couple of weeks ago, there was another event called Stockholm Tech Fest, where I was, I was also talking, uh, and I had to talk for five minutes, and it is much harder than to talk for one hour, because in five minutes to cover this subject is like impossible. I had to drag me off stage, basically, then. But I mean, in the car industry, that's the area where most people come in contact with this industry in a sort of more like a shocking way. Because everybody has heard about Siri and those kind of things already, where you can have, have automatic voice translation, 
function into algorithms which comes back with an answer. I can, I can ask my phone, what, uh, uh, what time is it now in Beijing? And the, 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 the phone will reply to you what time it is in Beijing. That is deep learning using neural networks to understand what you are saying. So that, that has been around for a while. But people haven't been thinking about that as deep learning. They thought of like, oh, okay, somebody wrote a good algorithm, but it was actually deep learning. This, everybody gets shocked when you see a, dr a car without a driver. So that is more of a shock to everybody that, okay, now there is a car without a driver. How did this happen? So this is because we have somebody developed an algorithm that can be uh, developed over time automatically and become better and better to drive a car. The same time, uh, the same way really that the guy that wrote the cat algorithm that became much, much better to detect the cats in the pictures. So now we have come to the stage where you can do more things than detect cats. You can actually have a car without a driver. So there are some now experiments in Pittsburgh with Volvo, Uber and Ford where there are these kind of cars are now driving on the streets, picking up passengers who are like paying customers. And there is actually a driver, but that's because of legal reason. You know how it is with US and lawyers. You don't want to get in the way of a lawsuit. So if you can avoid that would be great. So that's why there's still a driver sitting there, but it's not, he's not touching the steering wheel. So eventually the driver will go away uh, when these systems become more mature and more established. So there are some funny videos actually on, on YouTube where you can see the machine improving the way it's driving. And it's really awkward in the first <laughs> few, a few drives. And it's you know, very quickly picking up and gets very stable. Uh, so that's machine learning, I guess, in practice with all the sensors and uh, you know, everything happening in real time. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, I encourage you to take a look at that. In a couple of weeks in Amsterdam, uh, we had the uh, NVIDIA's GTC Europe. We were there together with Dell, and um, there we showed, uh, developed by the Delft University in, in Netherlands, they had a similar drive as the one to the left here. It was actually bigger, it was called a pod, so it can take up to 12 persons, and it had no driver's seat or anything like that. So 12 persons in a sort of a minibus that was driving around and on in the street uh, by what uh, we called autonomous driving. Autonomous is a great word. It's a little bit hard to say autonomous, but if you practice a lot, you get the feeling. But autonomous means like it it's, it's can take care of itself. It doesn't need human supervision. So it's actually like, uh, 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 there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people beside this guy who has children at home. So children actually work like that. They, they learn from seeing things and hearing things, and they process this in their mind, and the mind is kind of a neural network. So children is already a product that works in this way, actually. But now, for the first time, we have been able to create a computer algorithm that works a little bit similar to the human brain, that it can teach itself to do something. And this something, for in this example, happens to be driving a car. I already talked, told you about the, the heart, and I told you about the cats. And now it is up to you in your line of work and the work you do in your business, you can start thinking about what can I do with my data? Because I'm sure you all have data in your companies. The question, how can I work with my data and how can I get started with deep learning? So my usual advice is not to, to give any advice because it's really, really hard to give other people advice about how to get started with deep learning. We have the product, so you can buy from NVIDIA, then Dell, then the, the sort of the starter kit, which we are showing in the booth. There is a starter kit where there is a, 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 a less expensive server with a less expensive GPU from NVIDIA in the starter kit just to get started on this and to, to get started to, to run these kind of algorithms in your computer. And I will be speaking a little bit more about what kind of software there is that runs on this kind of hardware as of today. Because there is a lot of also red solutions. You don't have to invent everything yourself. How much is a starter kit, the cheap one? What's the entry point? I don't. Uh, I think it's about uh, uh, 125,000 Swedish around there. 
But don't take me like a promise from me because I'm working from NVIDIA. So you have to ask the Dell people okay. who are like actually selling this. So, but that will be like a rim, something around in that area as a starter kit. And remember, a thousand times faster, right? A hundred, actually, in most cases. A hundred yeah. thousand. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, big, wh why is this happening now? Why is the fourth industrial revolution coming now? Uh, yeah, it's not about the, 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 that we actually managed to detect cats. Uh, the, the reason why it's happening is because uh, there's some, some things are happening at the same time. So we have what's called an inflection point in industry. So there is a lot of data out there. We have been covering that. I mean, most of the people are here to talk about data today. So I guess you all have a lot of data. At the same time, computing power has been becoming more affordable. So as long as you can do something in parallel with a parallel algorithm, you can use a GPU instead of a GPU, and it's only 100 times faster than, uh, yeah, than, than a server technology. Yeah. Yeah, not 1,000, 100, but, but, but that's a lot. I mean, it, it, it lowers the cost barrier to do this kind of you know, iterative work on your data that is possible now with this. Any questions on that? I'm not the one, by the way, who invented this. It was like I'm a silly magazine, but I mean, I'm normally it's one way of uh, you know, staying with all the buzzwords. So, so looking at the NVIDIA data then from NVIDIA. Another question. Yeah. I have a question to the yeah. audience. Can anybody think of a use case where this type of technology could be applied? Anders, I mean, you work at Spotify. You have shitloads of data. You have lots of interesting use cases and problems and opportunities. Are you using GPUs today? Not for the deep learning part. Okay. Shoot. Normally, you know, normally um, deep learning is a lot about cats, and it would be nice to actually move to some more interesting applications. And also, it's not only about cats; it's about some kind of vision, some kind of picture or video we work with, or it's about some kind of audio, or it's some kind of piece of text that you work with. They have something in common. They all have some kind of sequence where the order of the features, input features, matters. So they, are, they have a sequence. But there are a lot of applications that are outside of this area, where you don't have a sequence uh, of the actual input features. So especially as, as long as you move into some classification or regression problem, you usually have a set of features that you work with, and then you would like to use um, potentially deep learning for that as well, because it has the promise of, you know, I don't have to do feature engineering anymore. I can just put in my raw data and poof, it should work, which is, of course, not true, because you have to, you know, pre-process and especially audio, you have to do this melt spectrogram as we do in Spotify to understand the raw audio data, etc. So it's still a lot of a machine, uh, machine Sorry, a lot of feature engineering that you have to do, but less, so potentially good. But the question then is, um, can we use it for like a normal classification task? Would that make sense? Uh, so hearing more about some examples that you use non-sequel uh, sequence data for would be interesting. Um, Google actually released a paper about this this summer um, that talks about wide and deep learning. Um, so that is basically for normal classification regression tasks and mm -hmm. this combination of deep net versus the normal logistic yeah. regression. Have yeah. you been in contact and have any experience with that type of application? That not, goes me, beyond not me personally, I can say. I mean, I'm, I'm only covering the Nordics and I haven't seen it happening here. I am discussing similar problems with some large, large companies who do seismic research. And there is a problem there with uh, having uh, more like a three-dimensional thing, uh, data that you want to attack. Mm. And the problem is that when you start putting everything in layers, you know, you sort of lose the three-dimensional gra grasp. Yeah. And you need to get to keep that sort of thing. And we are uh, working on like the first generation of, of, of deep learning on that kind of data. And, but it's, it's research. It's research. And that's where we are. I mean, this is like most of these things are like one or, or maximum five years old. Mm. And a lot of the work that we do currently are in, in, in collaboration with companies, but it's not ready. And a lot of the things in deep learning are not ready. That's why they, we, we, we prefer to call them, I think that's why they're called frameworks, because the frameworks is really just something like, a, like you get a piece of Lego. 
And, and, and it's not like, nowadays, Lego is super boring. You get something today and it's like a map. This is like a, a spaceship with a Darth Vader or something like that, you know. But back when I was old, I inherited Lego from my older brother. And there was no instructions. I can build whatever I wanted out of that Lego. I think we're more like that with my brother now. So now I've in inherited the cat work. And now we can make use of the cat work in new areas. But I mean, I'm not the one to, to be that intelligent. I'm just a sales guy anyway, you know. Let's see, you can see that from the tie. I would have been a severe problem if I have a t-shirt and I can't answer your question, but I have a tie, so that saves me. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> but Data uh, is the new bacon, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one, on one perhaps another yes. additional question if no one else has uh, yes. any other yeah, one. But we are, we are working closely with Google. And Google, of course, is... Um, yeah, Focusing a lot on deep learning as well. Yeah, and yeah. they recently released this new cloud ML service that is uh, in public beta now. So yeah, they are one of the. They are th basically three customers which are in very very important for us in their in the size of the purchases, yeah. and they are one of those. Yeah, yeah. So my question then would be, um, how does a normal GPU benchmark against you know, Google's, uh, Google's TPU, the tensor processing units. Are you yeah, pro yeah. building those as well, or do you know anything No, more? no, we are not building those. And uh, they are very meant to be designed to run a specific than uh, workload, as you might agree. Yeah. So, uh, and then comes back to my normal, this is a very interesting area, which I love to talk about. Uh, there is a correlation between volume and innovation. That's an example of innovation, where you would develop a ship that is really, really good at doing one specific thing. And we chose a different path. So we are creating a ship that is good at doing many, many different things. So we can use the same ship for all that, you know, computer gaming stuff, the same ship for different uh, uh, deep learning uh, frameworks, not only TensorFlow, but also like Cafe and Torch and you name it, and also GPU databases, which makes, make use of the super fast memory we have connected to our GPU. And, and, and some algorithms are just, you know, like, you know, very advanced mathematical things, with a six, which requires a 64-bit computing with a double floating point precision. So we, we do all of those things now in one chip. Not that it, it, it's, it's, not, it, it, it's not perfect, but it's going to be perfect uh, probably in the next release, which is coming in, in this autumn. So w we have chosen that part because it's about volume when it comes to ship. It's about volume, the number of developers that are on your platform, the, be, be able to, be, to be able to innovate also next time and next time and next time. It all comes with the number of organization that you interact with, the number of in, uh, professors, the number of developers, the number of uh, hardware companies like Dell that you're collaborating with. So we think, we think we're going to have a combination about innovation, but also volume. So volume sort of makes sure that we get new research money coming in, that we can continue to do these ships, which is the only thing we do. So we are totally focused on doing these ships. But they are also an amazing company, and they sh might choose to do their own ships, but they have so many other things to think about as well, being that company, you know. Mm. Their, their main thing is not to make ships. Okay, so have you seen any benchmarks? Do you know anything about I haven't seen anything like that, no, but mm. I'm pretty sure that we are superior if you compare two codes. If maybe you run, can run just one code, where we, if that chip is specific to, for that code, I'm sure it will be perform excellent on that code. Mm. But then you try to run another code on it and we get a different result. So th that's the good thing about GPUs is that you can use them for some... But you might even buy them for one purpose and then you find out, oh, I can use it also for this. So that is the, what we are trying to make is a, 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 like a new compute platform that works for every kind of need for compute, including uh, drones or robots, and we, where we have the what is called the Jetson pack. You know, you can you can develop a, a self-driving not only car but also a self-driving lawn mover or aeroplane or drone or anything that you want to do. So it's it's all an open ecosystem, and we we worked with everybody. We like to work not only with Google but we work with everybody. So I think it was good that I had this slide up now because it really proves what I'm saying, doesn't it? Yep. Cool. Thanks. I, I was really lucky. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So moving on to the to, to next slide. So I, I started talking about that everybody in this room has data. So if anybody thinks that today you have too little data, you can take it easy, but you're going to get so much more data in the future. Because there are so many things out there now which generates data. 
everything from a mobile phone to a Spotify player and a car and a drone and a refrigerator. And soon we'll have all those devices which will be connected to the net in some kind of way. They will generate data and they will send that data back to its mother or its father or its company which made it or, or, or the company that installed it. So you, you just have to decide where to send the data and how to save that data. Once you have saved all that data, you're going to have so much data that you actually will probably get a little bit sick of it, you know. So the question is that if you have that enormous amount of data in the future, how can you work on this data? So then, then you can actually start already seeing now there's two purposes then with the GPU. Not only is it maybe to look with deep learning on this data, but there's also a possibility to, to, to store this data in some kind of a Hadoop or Spark cluster, and then uh, to work on that data using some kind of a, a, a accelerated tool that you can work on this data. So either you, the accelerated tool can be your GPU database with visualization layer that we are showing in the booth together with Dell today. So you can go there and, and look at how you can work with data using, it, it's a red solution. So that is not deep learning. That's something that somebody else wrote the code. You just have to implement it and look at your data. But that is still a person then looking at the data, but it can look at the actual data in real time. Very large data sets being developed by, by people that already had this amount of data. So it comes from that background that some people had a really large amount of data. So they had to develop a solution how to look at this enormous amount of data. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, another way is of course then to, you can also try to work on this with uh, something called that SAP is showing in their booth, the SAP HANA, where you look at the SAP data correlated with some other data. And you can look at it real time using that technology, which is today not, uh, accelerated by GPUs, but that will also be accelerated by GPUs in the future. They've just started that journey to move that from the archaic x86 architecture over to the modern GPU architectures. So that is a work that has been started and we'll probably see some fruits on that work as well in the, in the next year or so.